fasting positions you where you can be heard. The fear of death leaves us. The fear of death goes away from you because you understand something that for you there is a promise that goes beyond this world now. For you, there is a promise that exceeds anything today. What an amazing thing to think about. That this is what is going to happen. So Jesus rescued those who were caught in Sheol and could not leave Sheol and join him in heaven with the Father. So now they are in heaven. Multitudes. So when John is shown this revelation, he's seeing the multitudes that Jesus rescued. And from then on, the door was opened. So everyone who dies in Christ immediately translates to be with Christ right away. Many times we are looking to skip process, not realizing that's how God works. Let's look at when the Israelites leave Egypt. The scripture says something interesting. It says... And God did not take them by the short way through the land of the Philistines. For he said, lest they see war and turn back to Egypt. But he took them by the long way through the wilderness. Why? Because he is interested not only in them winning battles, but in the process of their own formation that they may know or that they may learn that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He teaches them lessons of dependence on Him. He teaches them lessons through that journey in the wilderness. Because He knew they were not ready. They may have all the equipment externally, but internally they were not ready. Everything that interferes with soundness of mind is a manipulation from the enemy. Everything that requires you to switch off soundness of mind, don't be fooled. Faith, it is true, faith is not logical, that is true. But it should not come at the expense of soundness of mind. Sober-minded decision to obey an instruction. So it is a faith act. It may not look logical in the natural, but it has not come out of an extreme of emotion. It has a moment of sound reasoning of saying, I have had him, not because someone stirred up some excitement in us. Your actions reflect the will of God. And so you are manifesting his will on earth. And that's very important to note. You're manifesting the will of God on earth. So the will of God or the perfect will of God is for you to be able to receive divine guidance. It's for you to have an understanding of his plans and purposes. That's why he says, when people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. You, God wants you to be able to see what he's doing. Hello and welcome to Strong Meet. Um, it's always a pleasure and a privilege to come to you. Um, what an amazing thing we have here that God is always teaching us great and mighty things and we are learning 
um, as I've been sharing over the past weeks, um, some years ago, I was in the midst of a 40-day fast. Uh, in fact, I was on the last night of my 40-day fast. And um, I had a dream. In the dream, I saw a book. And in the book, it was written, The Laws of Promotion. And then the book opened. And I saw chapter headings. I remember waking up and rushing to my laptop to type out the chapter headings I had seen. I knew for sure that the Lord was speaking to me about a book I needed to write. Of course, um, I had uh, questions. I said, why promotion of all things? Um, I tend to be more focused on other topics. For those who hear me preach, I tend to preach on, a, you know, on other topics altogether. So I wondered why of all things God would have me teach on promotion. But as life has gone on, as the years have gone on since then, I have seen the need and why God would ask me to speak on this topic and to teach more on it. First of all, um, promotion, the desire for promotion, for elevation is natural. It is a desire God has placed in each of us. Nobody wants to remain stagnant. All of us are always desirous of going to the next level. We are always desirous of increasing, of multiplying. It is a natural desire that God placed in us. In fact, God demands promotion. God demands elevation. The Bible tells us we go from glory to glory. We go from faith to faith. It is a natural thing. It is something that God himself placed in us. In fact, promotion is such a thing that God placed that God himself requires profit and increase. Um, when he gives the talent, the one who hides it in the ground and doesn't multiply it, God condemns him. So God requires growth from us. God requires increase from us. God requires elevation from us. Well, here today, as we continue, this is part three um, of our series on promotion. And um, very soon I'll be publishing this book so that as many as possible can have access to this that the Lord showed me, that he taught me concerning promotion. And I know that many lives will be changed. But you, the special people on Strong Meat, um, I felt I should share it with you and um, in a series of messages. And I believe you'll be greatly blessed. Um, and of course, as I'm doing this right now, this is a time for you to send this message, you know, get this link, share it with your friends. Um, send someone a message and say, hey, you really need to hear this. This will bless you. Um, and bless someone, help them. You know, maybe there are errors they're making. Maybe there's a mistake they're about to make that could destroy their life. Or maybe there's something they're not doing that they need to hear that will help them in this journey. So therefore, um, take a moment, share, invite someone to join us on this program. And I know they will be greatly blessed. I am convinced they will be greatly blessed. Well, um, so we've, we've studied, we started with promotion comes from the Lord. And there's no doubt about the question that promotion comes from the Lord. The scriptures are clear. Promotion comes neither from the east, the west, or the south, but it comes from the Lord. Uh, we went into detail about it. Um, last week, we talked about promotion having a set time. It has a set time and a season. And we talked about understanding times and seasons. And uh, in the same mindset, in the same frame of mind, I want to talk about the fact that promotion is conferred, it is not grabbed. This is something really important. Many have shipwrecked themselves on this one. Promotion is conferred. It is not grabbed. And let's go to the scriptures very quickly. I want to take us to the scriptures. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 15. This is a story most of us know. But I want to bring out some things that I pray will be a blessing to you. Um, from verse 1 it says, And it came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses, and fifty men ran before him. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city are you? And he said, Thy servant is one of the tribes of Israel. 
And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. And Abs Absalom said moreover, All oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. It was so that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. So what we see here is a, one of the saddest stories you can read. You see, Absalom was David's eldest son. Not only was he David's eldest son, he was from one of David's favorite wives. David loved Absalom with all his heart. And Absalom was amazing. You see, Absalom, he, was, um, he had the most beautiful hair. The whole land used to talk about his hair. He was a handsome guy, well-built guy. Beautiful hair. He knew how to talk to people. He was literally built for kingship, you could say. So he is Absalom, who by all rights and means is entitled to become the next king. I mean, he's the eldest son and he's the most excellent among them, both in stature and wisdom and in the way he conducted himself. The problem is Absalom Absalom's life was characterized by impatience. You see, Absalom had a sister called Tamar. And then he had a half-brother called Amnon. And um, Amnon, his brother, ended up, his half-brother ended up raping Tamar, Absalom's sister. Absalom got impatient with the fact that David seemed not to do anything about the situation. David seemed to be, you know, because, Abs you know, the Bible tells us David was very angry. Yet it doesn't tell us that David did anything to Amnon after Amnon raped Tamar. So we have a situation where Absalom gets really, really angry. And he is impatient for justice. So what does he do? He hatches a plot at which he ends up killing Amnon. And then he has to flee into exile because of what he has done. But David loves Absalom so much that when Joab, you know, Joab can tell that David is very sad that his son is in exile. He can tell that David really misses his son. And it's only David's principles keeping him back from bringing Absalom back because obviously Absalom killed his own brother. And David doesn't want to bring Absalom back after he did something like that because then he would have to take action. Joab convinces David to bring Absalom back because he can see how heavy David's heart is. So you can tell how much David loved Absalom that even when Absalom killed his own brother, David still misses Absalom greatly. Absalom returns. But we can tell that there is a problem. Absalom is very impatient. After Absalom comes back, even though he has come back, David does not allow Absalom into his presence for quite a while. And Absalom, so Absalom wants to get audience with the king and keeps standing for Joab. Remember, this is the Joab who helped Absalom come back to the land. And when Joab is not responding to Absalom's request in the time Absalom wants to, Absalom gets men and tells them to set fire to Joab's fields. So we can see that there is a problem Absalom has, and that's impatience and expediency. He has a tendency to settle, to want to do quick things, to take shortcuts. Joab is not listening to me. Let me set fire to his fields. So that he has a reason to come and talk to me. Now, just imagine that is Absalom. And um, of course, Joab comes and talks to him. I mean, he's very angry. His fields have been set on fire. Meanwhile, this is a man who helped you come back from exile. So you can already see that 
Absalom has absolutely no regard for even his own allies. He is disrespectful even to his own allies. Even to those who are on his side. When he wants something, he will do whatever it takes, even if it means bringing loss, causing loss to his own allies. Because this is Joab. Joab was his friend. Joab is one who managed to arrange to bring him back, and yet he burns the man's fields. Now, after he's given back access, we see Absalom begin to hatch a plot, and it's a deliberate one. First of all, he gets himself 50 men and chariots so that he can look big and important. Then he positions himself such that when anyone has come to see the king for justice, he can get to them first. And he'll ask him, where do you come from? If they want to bow down to him, he'll lift them up. And so he had a false humility. I have met many an Absalom. False humility. They will act you know all sorts of things there are things they say and you can even tell they're excessive who am i to even get a chance to talk to you what an amazing opportunity and you're thinking but that's not true but they exaggerate and that's how you often can tell people with absalom spirit their humility is exaggerated it's not normal it's not natural because they want to fool you. They're trying to buy their way into your heart by appealing to your pride. This is what Absalom did. Absalom, you know, and in that way, and then he would tell them, oh, you know, now, subtly, he begins to undermine the king. Because when he would ask them, what brought you here? Oh, you came to talk to the king. Can you imagine? You know, if the king would only just appoint a judge over the land, you know, you know, I, I could judge these issues so easily, you know. And of course, you think about it. Someone has come to the king with an issue and he said the same things to everyone who came to the king, which means he would say the same thing if, if you were in a land dispute with someone, he would say the same thing to each of you. So each of you would be thinking Absalom would have ruled in my favor. All he's doing is buying his way into people's hearts. So he makes it feel, look like the king is negligent. You know, if he, had, if, if he had appointed me, I would ex, ex, expedite these issues and deal with them quickly. I would, be, do, I would give justice in your, in your favor. So there, and it says in this way, he stole the heart of Israel. It was a deliberate plan. So, and you know what's interesting? He was successful. His father ends up having to flee the city. And Absalom becomes king. But then you see something very interesting. Ultimately, Absalom failed. And we will see why. Second Samuel chapter 17 from verse 14, it says, Then Absalom and all the men of Israel said, Hushai's advice is better than Ahithophel's. It says, For the Lord had determined to defeat the council of Ahithophel, which really was the better plan, so that he could bring disaster on Absalom. What do we see? Because Absalom chose to promote himself, because Absalom chose to raise himself up, because he chose to plot to put himself in the position, God himself began to resist him. The Bible is clear, it says God resists the proud. God resists the proud. Every time, everything Absalom was doing was coming out of pride, even though he was presenting a false front of humility. There was a false humility, but it was all born out of pride. And you can tell, it's the same thing Lucifer did. Otherwise, how, do, how did he manage to convince a third of the angels to follow him? But staying on Absalom for right now, you've got to understand something. If you fight, if you try to grab a promotion, instead of waiting on the Lord, who is the Lord of all promotions, to come fight upon you, the Lord himself will fight you. The Bible says the Lord determined to frustrate the counsel of Haithophel. 
Remember, Ahithophel was so wise in the land of Israel that they said his counsel was like the counsel of God. When he spoke, you knew that this man, the kind of wisdom he's spoken, you, you may as well have heard from God. That's how wise Ahithophel was. And now, he, Ahithophel gives advice, says, give me some men. And I chase after David while he's still tired. And I'll come upon him and destroy him. It was the better plan. Because David was tired. He was dispirited, depressed. He's had to run away from the city unprepared. You know, he, in fact, people had to bring him food. He hadn't planned for it. Ziba had to bring food along the way. You know, Basilai. You know, there were, there were people who came to help him because it was un. It was unplanned. He just had suddenly, hey, Absalom has taken over. You're in trouble. He's gone marching on Jerusalem now and he fled. In fact, he fled so quickly that he had to leave his own concubines behind. And Absalom ended up sleeping with them. So he was unprepared. Therefore, Ahithophel's counsel was actually the wiser one. But because God had determined to frustrate, when God has determined to frustrate you, you will begin to do stupid things. A spirit of foolishness will come upon you. You make decisions that are suboptimal. You make choices that don't make sense. If people will wonder what has happened to you, why are you doing things like this? That's what happened to Absalom. Suddenly, the advice of Hushai sounded wiser. He'd been working with Ahithophel all this time. In fact, the whole plot had been hatched with the counsel of Ahithophel. Ahithophel was so wise that David used to rely on him for counsel as well. He knew him to be extremely wise, so when he heard that Ahithophel was with Absalom, he fled quickly because he knew whatever plan Ahithophel has come up with is too good, we need to flee before we get destroyed. But now, because God himself is fighting Absalom, Absalom can't even tell when he's being given stupid advice. Especially because Hushai is sharp enough to give him bad advice while stroking his pride. He says, no, 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 no. Instead of doing it this way. I mean, Ahithophel is known for wisdom. But this time, mm -mm, you should lead the army yourself. Gather the whole of Israel. And lead the army yourself. Now he's appealing to his pride. Meanwhile, Ahithophel immediately realizes this guy is headed for destruction. He's not listening anymore. He's headed for destruction. He can tell the pride is going to destroy the young man. In fact, Ahithophel went home and hanged himself. He knew this thing was going to end badly. He decided he would end it on his own terms. We won't talk about Ahithophel and his choices because there was a lot behind them. But what we can see is because God himself is fighting Absalom, that's why he's making those suboptimal decisions. It's, it's a very bad thing to be in a place where God himself is opposing you. And the Bible says, God opposes the proud and lifts up the humble. And when God's talking about the humble, he's not talking about this false humility that Absalom's have. Oh, don't kneel down, don't kneel down. I'm dead. Who are you to even come and greet me? What a privilege I have to even talk to you. You know, all these things they say that just brush your ego and make you feel big and important. But they don't actually think that way. When you're gone, they will start mocking you. That's how Absalom's behave. No, he's talking about people who are genuinely humble. Genuinely humble people are not, do not put themselves down. I often like to remind people that, you know, humility is not thinking less of yourself. No, humility is thinking of yourself less. I don't know if you get it. But it means don't don't bring down your self-esteem, your, your uh, who you are. Humility doesn't mean you don't know your identity. You don't know who you are. No. But humility means you're not constantly thinking about yourself all the time and exalting yourself. You know who you are, but you don't need to parade yourself everywhere. So humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. Don't be there constantly putting yourself at the top of everything. So God resists the proud. 
And the moment Absalom began to grab promotion, because promotion comes from the Lord, it is his area, it is his place, God himself resisted Absalom. Absalom ended up dead, destroyed in a terrible way. Now, so there he ends up with clouded thinking and making suboptimal decisions. Now let's see what happened when he took that advice. Second Samuel chapter 18, verse 9 and then also verses 14 to 17 says, During the battle, Absalom happened to come upon some of David's men. He tried to escape on his mule, but as he rode beneath the thick branches of a great tree, his hair got caught in the tree. The mule kept going and left him dangling in the air. I want you to note something because everything in scripture is there for a reason. It is this little line here about his hair getting caught in the tree that tells us why in the first place the scriptures told us about Absalom's hair. How Absalom's hair was so amazing. How the whole of Israel used to marvel at his hair. How it was, it was his pride and joy. The scriptures are trying to show us something. Absalom gets caught by his hair in a tree. He's trying to show us that uh -uh, what had led him to this position was his pride. His pride is what had led him there. And the hair is one of the most significant depictions of his pride. So Absalom is caught by his hair. In the branches of a tree. Can you imagine getting caught by your hair? And the mule leaves you. And now you're dangling. You are caught by the hair. So which means you're literally almost hanging. Can you imagine how painful it must have been? I mean, his hands must be on the branch trying to hold himself up. Because anyone, any one of you knows if someone was to pull you by the hair. It's very painful. Now your entire body weight is caught because of hair. You All your hands... Are going to be trying to keep you you can't even defend yourself you're just dangling what an ignoble way now of course they go and tell joab and he's thinking why did you kill him and the people are all saying ah we heard what david said david said don't touch the young man see how much david loved absalom that even after absalom does a rebellion not only does he do a rebellion, he goes and sleeps with all of David's concubines, one by one, just to show everyone that me and this guy are separate. Can you imagine sleeping with your father's wives? To prove a point. Yet David is saying, for my sake, deal gently with the young man Absalom. That's how much he loved him. That tells you how much Absalom, the throne, was going to be his anyway. He was the eldest son. He would have gotten that throne. That's how much David loved him. But the impatience and pride comes in the way. Now, it, let's see what happens. This is Joab now. He says, enough of this nonsense, Joab said. Then he took three daggers and plunged them into Absalom's heart as he dangled still alive in the great tree. Can you imagine? Joab who had been Absalom's ally in the beginning. The one who negotiated with David to bring Absalom back from exile. The one who negotiated again to give Absalom access to his father David again and reconcile them is now the one who ends up killing him. This is what happens when you're impatient. First of all, Absalom's impatience had turned Joab's heart against him. Because it burnt the man's fields just to get the man's attention. He'd repaid him evil for good. Some people are so caught up in their self-importance and how big they are that they treat everyone like trash. They, they think, I mean, I'm the king's son. I can do whatever I want. So they treat people like trash. And they don't think about the fact that someday these very same people who they think should be allies might be the ones to turn against them and betray them. Then also they don't think about the fact that sometimes Joab did everything he did for Absalom, not because of Absalom, but because of David. Joab is so absolutely loyal to David that when he sees that David is sad about his son being in exile, he does something about it. 
And that's why when David doesn't want to see Absalom after Absalom has returned from exile, Joab does nothing and doesn't respond to Absalom's entreaties to go and talk to David for him. Until Absalom forces the issue. The problem is Absalom never ever realized that the loyalty was to his father, not to him. And that any loyalty Joab showed him was because of his relationship with his cousin, David. Because Joab and Abishai were the sons of David's sister, Zeruiah. Now, so can you imagine the same Joab now ends up being the one to kill Absalom? Not only that, kills him and puts him in a pit. Ten of Joab's young armor bearers then surrounded Absalom and killed him. Then Joab blew the ram's horn and his men returned from chasing the army of Israel. They threw Absalom's body into a deep pit in the forest and piled a great heap of stones over it. Can you imagine? A king's son ends up buried in a pit somewhere in a forest. What had seemed to succeed ends in ignominy. Why? Because he tried to grab something before its time. He tried to take that which was not. In fact, when you try to grab a promotion that, was, that is not yours, even the ones who were your friends and advocates before, they will desert you and they will turn against you. You see, when you get blinded by ambition, you will fail to realize that promotion is conferred. It is not taken by force. Now, you know, there are many examples here. Adonijah, Absalom's brother, never learned from his brother's example. Years later, Adonijah also rises up. And you know, ironically, Adonijah does the same thing his brother did. He also first gets 50 men and horses and chariots, like his brother Absalom had done. And you know what? Adonijah, Adonijah also ends up dead. And here is the interesting thing. Adonijah was next in line after Absalom in terms of age. He had a good chance at the throne. So much so, Adonijah, in fact, you know, you, you think about it, that David loved these sons of his so much and favored them so much that for some reason, they began to, uh, they grew in pride. Let's see how it says something about David here and how he treated his sons. That he indulged them, he never rebuked them, he never corrected them. Here it is, it says, First Kings chapter 1 from verse 5 to 11. It says, about that time, David's son Adonijah, whose mother was Haggith, began boasting, I will make myself king. You see that? The idea of I will make myself. His father is still alive. Yes, he's very old. He needs a little girl to, to sleep in the bed to keep him warm at night because he can no longer stay warm. Um, but he's still alive. But, Dev, but here is Adonijah saying, I will make myself king. So he provided himself with horses and charioteers and recruited 50 men to run in front of him. Same thing his brother Absalom had done. Says, now his father, King David, had never disciplined him at any time. Not even by asking, why are you doing that? So Adonijah had been indulged from when he was young. Whatever he wanted, he got. His father would never discipline him or rebuke him. Says, Adonijah had been born next after Absalom, and he was very handsome. These sons of Haggith, they, they were handsome boys, which probably tells you that Haggith was a very beautiful woman. And they were David's favorite kids, so he indulged them. Now, it says, Adonijah took Joab, son of Zeruiah, and Abiathar the priest into his confidence, and they agreed to help him become king. See the problem? 
he is he is now plotting with the army commanders and one of the priests it says but zadok the priest benaiah son of jehoiada nathan the prophet he may ray and david's personal bodyguard refused to support adonijah see there were key people that refused nathan the prophet when he refuses you should, you have to pay attention when a prophetic voice in the land says mm -mm. when a prophetic voice says uh, 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 wait hold on those are warning signs it says adonijah went to the stone of zoheleth near the spring of enrogel where he sacrificed sheep and cattle and fattened calves. He invited all his brothers, the other sons of King David, and all the royal officials of Judah. But he did not invite Nathan the prophet or Beniah or the king's bodyguard or his brother Solomon. The fact that he didn't invite Solomon tells you that he was aware that David was planning to make Solomon king instead. Then Nathan went to Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, and asked her, Haven't you heard that Haggith's son Adonijah has made himself king? And our Lord David does, doesn't even know about it. Now let's skip. Of course, well, you know, Bathsheba talks to David and everything. David calls people together and he anoints Solomon king and steps down from the throne. So verse 41. Now there's great celebrating. It says, Adonijah and his guests had the celebrating and shouting just as they were finishing their banquet. When Joab heard the sound of the ram's horn, he asked, what's going on? Why is the city in such an uproar? And while he was still speaking, Jonathan, son of Abiathar the priest, arrived. Come in, Adonijah said to him, for you a good man, you must have good news. That tells you something interesting about the lack of judgment Adonijah had. He assumed just because a man is good, all the news he carries is good. Now, one thing you notice is, Adonijah wakes up and decides to make himself king. His father is still alive. Adonijah could have gone to his father and said, you know what? I want to be king after you. His father could have been clear and told him, you know what? That throne is not for you. God has told me Solomon should be. Or maybe he would have even given it to him. Or maybe he would have told him, I'll make you a co-ruler with your brother. There's precedent in Israel for that. But he instead decides to set himself up, sets the banquet, invites the leading army officers. I mean, it's amazing what he does. Big party. All without David even being aware of what was going on. Now, here is the interesting thing. When David takes action and instead raises someone else, you know, Solomon doesn't initially do anything about Adonijah, even after his, his father David has died. But Adonijah does not cease trying to promote himself. The next thing you know, Adonijah decides to go through Solomon's mother to ask for the girl who used to sleep in the bed with David to keep him warm. He says, let them give her to me as a wife. Solomon, of course, realized what this meant. Remember, this is someone who first tried to make himself king. Now he's asking for the one who used to sleep with his father, the king, to become his wife, to increase his legitimacy. So that he has another way of plotting yet again. And Solomon decides he's going to kill him. And Adonijah ends up dead. In ignominy like that again. You see, some of the things we miss is this. For example, when the prophet Samuel anointed David to be king, Saul was still king in Israel. In fact, God had clearly said that he was grieved that he had made Saul king. Yet, David was all, uh, in fact, he. You see, here is an interesting thing. God said, I'm grieved that I made Saul king. And then he said, I have chosen David to take his place. Yet David never tried to overthrow Saul in order to take over before his time. Despite the fact that the greatest prophet in the land had come and poured oil on his head and told him, you are the next king. 
David instead served under Saul. He understood that things happen in the correct times and seasons, and that if God, if God has anointed him to be the next king, then God will be the one to set him up and confide upon him. And we see it. David never made himself king. When Saul had died and David returned to Hebron, it was the people that came and asked David to become their king. And afterwards, it was still Abner that came looking for David and went around to gather the rest of Israel. And Israel is the one that came together to David at Hebron to make him king over the rest of the nation. David didn't go and try to conquer Israel by force. No. He did not. Instead, he allowed things. In fact, he reigned in Hebron seven years. While Ishbosheth was really was ruling the rest of Israel, despite knowing clearly that Ishbosheth was never meant to be king, that God had said it is him who was to be the next king, but he did not still think it's something he should take by force, but rather to let God position him right. You see. A promotion, even if it is God who gave it to you, if you attempt to take it by force, it won't last. You will destroy your own legitimacy. You will short circuit the plans of God and still end up losing that which God Himself gave you. Every time you try to take by force that which God was going to grant you, you have again put yourself in the same position as the ones who are taking what was not theirs in the first place, like Absalom. You see, David twice had opportunities to kill Saul. And he could have justified himself. They said, this guy is no longer in God's favor. The spirit of the Lord left him. An evil spirit is actually the one that lives on him. And the one who even has to play the harp to calm him down when evil spirits are on him and he's ranting and raving in the house. But he doesn't. In 1 Samuel chapter 24 and in 1 Samuel chapter 26, two occasions, David has a, an opportunity to kill Saul. And had he killed him, he could have taken over. First of all, because at that point, Jonathan had clearly acknowledged that David was meant to be the next king, not him. In fact, he had, he had even told David, I will be second to you. Now, he knew that it is God who had placed Saul on the throne. And that therefore it's only God who should remove Saul from the throne. Despite the fact that that same God has anointed him. Now, it is not your role to remove the person above you. Even if God has told you that you are the one supposed to occupy that position. Even if God tells you. Diomani, ikanise eno go gendo jisu mba msajoyo sika. You don't then create a plot to unseat him. Because if you do, judgment will come on you. The Bible tells us that the one time David sneaked up and cut off a bit of, a bit of Saul's skirt, that his heart smote him. He's conscious. And guess who, what happens? David was filled with the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit convicting him that even that small act was outside of what he was supposed to do. He was supposed to leave God to place him and position him. Don't try to unseat the one above you because you had a word from God. The anointing that placed them there will fight you. You know? Not only that, the Bible teaches us that what a man sows is what he reaps. Even if it is God who told you, to take a position. If you try, if you take it by force and plot to take it, the Bible is clear what a man sows is what he reaps. That seed of rebellion you have sowed is the same seed of rebellion that will come against you later. I'll give you an example. 
Um, Elijah, when he goes to the mountain, after 40 days in the wilderness, he gets to the mountain. There's the wind, the fire, and the earthquake, and the still small voice, God speaks to him. And God gives him instructions. He tells him to anoint Hazael, Hazael, king of Syria. Then he tells him to anoint Jehu, king of Israel. And of course, to anoint Elisha to take his place. Notice a couple of things. Number one, when Elijah comes and puts his cloak upon Elisha, Elisha doesn't assume he has automatically become the next prophet. Instead, he goes and serves Elijah until Elijah is taken up. Only then does he step into Elijah's shoes. Yet God had told Elijah, anoint Elisha to take your place. But here is the other part. God tells Elijah to anoint Jehu, king of Israel. And at some point, you know, Elijah sends a younger prophet. This prophet goes, and um, when Jehu is in a meeting of captains, he anoints him to be the next king. Pours oil on his head. Then Jehu made the classic mistake. Jehu then plots to destroy Ahab's entire family. Jehu goes, kills Jezebel. He, dis, you know, he, he kills Amaziah. Ahaziah actually is the name. Ahaziah, who was um, the, the next, the son of, of Ahab, and takes over in a military coup. And later you read the scripture saying, and I will recompense the blood of the house of Ahab upon Jehu. And you think to yourself, but God, you are the one who appointed Jehu. In fact, you even prophesied how Jezebel shall die. You see, when you take it upon yourself to become the one who executes the prophecies of God and makes them to come to pass, you place yourself in a very dangerous position. Yes, Jehu had been anointed king, but he could have trusted that God will arrange the situation in order to put him there rather than execute a military coup. But instead, he goes and he plots and he kills Ahaziah. And then he comes and he kills Jezebel. Yes, Elijah the prophet had prophesied that the dogs will eat Jezebel. But he hadn't prophesied that Jehu will have to be the one to order her killed. Jehu had the zeal, but he was impatient. And there ends up being judgment upon Jehu because of the seed he sowed. The seed of rebellion he sowed comes back to haunt him. Many of us, that's what happens. God even speaks to you, tells you that's your position. That's where you're meant to be. Then the problem is, instead of leaving and trusting it into God's hand, you begin to plot to make it happen for yourself. Such does not last. Jehu's dynasty did not last. Had he been like David and trusted that, okay, God has said I will be, let me see how he works it out. His could have been the dynasty that ends up being running over Israel for the next how many years. But it didn't last because he sowed the wrong seed even in a word that he got gotten from God. You can short circuit a word God gave you. You can destroy a destiny that God has given you by impatience and trying to grab that which is meant to just be conferred upon you. Don't grab that which should be conferred. Hallelujah. In fact, you can see that David understood this principle. Seriously. Let's uh, first Samuel chapter 26. After David has spared Saul's life in the cave, says, the Lord gives his own reward for doing good and for being loyal. And I refuse to kill you even when the Lord placed you in my power. Who placed him in, in David's power? The Lord himself. Why? It was a test of David's character. Can he trust God to be the one to promote him? Or is he going to try and grab it for himself, kill the man and take the position? It was actually the Lord. 
who placed Saul in David's power. But David understood that this was a test. So the answer says, the Lord gives his own reward for doing good and for being loyal. And I refuse to kill you even when the Lord placed you in my power, for you are the Lord's anointed one. Now may the Lord value my life even as I have valued yours today. May he rescue me from all my troubles. See, David understood the principle of seed and harvest. He understood that, okay, if I spare soul, God will cause someone to spare me. Who knows? If David hadn't spared Saul, maybe Absalom would have succeeded in his rebellion and killed David. God would still have eventually worked it out and put Solomon on the throne. Maybe, you know, they would have fled and then he comes back later and defeats Absalom or something. Those stories are there throughout scripture. But because David had sowed a good seed, he had done good and been loyal even when the one he was being loyal to was trying to kill him. You served the man loyal, loyally. You know, you've done everything in a very loyal manner. You've killed Philistines on his behalf. You've been faithful and he's seeking to kill you because of jealousy. And yet in spite of that, David doesn't take action. And in spite of knowing that he's been told he's supposed to be the one in that man's position. That that guy has expired. You know, God's tests are interesting. The way he tells you that guy has expired, I am no longer with him. And you can get tempted to take the position for yourself. That's a very dangerous place to be. Let's go to Isaiah 42, from verse 12 to 15. We see this same script playing out in way before man was even created. Isaiah 14 says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. See? He said in his heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Notice he says stars of God, meaning that one is not referring to physical stars. He's talking about the angels, the stars of God. That's why he calls them the stars of God, not the stars of the heavens. I'll exalt my throne above all the other angels, basically. Now, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. You notice that when the scripture says promotion doesn't come from the north, from the east, the west, or the south, it comes from the Lord. It doesn't mention the north. That's because God sits in the north. Hallelujah. So in the sides of the north, where God sits, that's where Lucifer wants. He says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. We always talk about these as the five I wills. I will ascend, I will exalt, I will sit. I will ascend, I will be. The five I will that led to Lucifer's fall. So I will, I will, I will. It's his will, not God's will. It says, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Lucifer was the son of the morning. That was the highest position in heaven set just below that of Christ himself. Because Christ is called the morning star. Lucifer is called the son of the morning. So Lucifer held a position just below that of Christ himself. Christ who is part of the Godhead. He, he was called the angel that covers. He, he used to walk with, between the very stones of fire in heaven. You must know one thing, that if you are to be promoted, you will be tested in that aspect of your character. There will come opportunities to promote yourself. There will come opportunities to exalt yourself. There will come opportunities to place yourself on the throne of the Most High, on the throne of the one you're supposed to replace. And there will also come opportunities where all you need to do is compromise a little. 
And you will have the thing you've dreamed of, the position you've always wanted. Those. Yeah. You see, Satan uses the same thing that had tripped him. He comes to Christ and he tells him, you know, here is a shortcut. All these nations have been given to me. Just bow down to me and I give them to you. He's basically telling him, you don't have to go and suffer. You don't have to go and die on the cross. You don't have to go through all of this. I can just hand it back to you. Just bow down and worship. Shortcuts. The enemy will try to bring you shortcuts. You will be tested in this aspect of your character. You see, you will get so many, you get an opportunity to, you, you will think, to you, you get opportunities. Some, some people, there may be trouble in the company. And you get opportunities to plot with others, maybe to bring down your boss. So that you can take his position. If you fall for that, that's how you will also end up being brought down by the very same people. Hallelujah. I want us to note something. When God raised up Joseph, when God promoted Joseph, he even created a new position for him. There was no such thing as governor of Egypt before Joseph. But because it was the time for his promotion, Pharaoh created a brand new position. Some of us, the problem is myopia. We look around and the only position we can see is the one directly above us. So we think we need to keep, bring down the person in it and take their position. And we don't think about the fact that God can create new positions for you. That you don't need to do a coup and fight and do other things in order to take a position that you can wait on God and God himself will promote you. He will create a place for you. Now, I've belabored this point in various ways and to bring certain things to us because compromise can destroy you. For some people, it won't be a coup that you're trying to pull down someone. For some of you, the way you try to grab your position may be in compromising. I'll give you an example. I've had opportunities when I got into ministry, full-time ministry. I had opportunities to compromise the message. I've had opportunities to compromise the message. I know very well that there are certain things, certain ways you can preach certain messages, certain things you can do that will bring crowds and make you famous very quickly. I'm well aware that I have an anointing. I have seen the blind see, the cripples walk, the deaf hear, you know, tumors disappear. You could prostitute that anointing and quickly become a household name. You could, you know, you could compromise and go to certain places and uh, accept whatever they are saying because, you know, you, because there sometimes there are big doors that can be offered to you, but that only at the expense of compromising the call. And what God has put upon your life. And the question is, at what cost? Because such does not last. Inevitably, there comes a time when the bill comes due. It came due for Jehu. It came due for Absalom. It will come due for you. Never think you'll be an exception to the rule. Well, I pray you've been blessed today by this message. I pray you're challenged. I pray most of all that the, you take the warning to heart that this is very important. You don't want to risk. You don't want to short circuit your path. You don't want to short circuit what God has for you by taking a shortcut, by doing a coup, by trying to remove the one who is above you that God has placed. Don't be in a hurry, child of God. Don't be in a hurry. Thank you for tuning in today. Um, it is awesome and wonderful to have you here today.
And I know that um, you've been blessed. Share with someone. Again, I want to encourage you. Share with someone. Get this link. Share it with someone. There's someone whose life you could save. There's someone whose destiny you could save. There's someone who you could help so that they are not destroyed. So I'm just, I beseech you by the masses of God. Don't keep it to yourself. Share so that you can save someone's destiny and someone's life. And I know that they will be blessed. Thank you for tuning in. Share widely. Put it on your Instagram. Put it on your WhatsApp. Put it everywhere. Put it on Facebook. Put it on your YouTube channel. We, we don't copyright these things. You can share it as broadly as possible. It is the word of God. And we know it will bless someone. Freely you have received. Freely give. We look forward. I, I ask you. Tune in for more of our programs. We've been doing a great series on rest, entering God's rest, you know, and unbelief. And um, we'll be continuing on that on Wednesday. I know you will be blessed. If you missed our Sunday message, you need to tune in. You will be encouraged. You will be challenged. you go to the next level. You can find all of our content on YouTube. We have playlists. We've properly organized it for you in playlists so that you can easily find it. If this was your first time tuning in to Strong Meet, well, let me tell you. We've been on doing strong meat for over two years now. For some of you, some of this, you need to go back and hear the original messages from the beginning because each message builds upon the other. Each message builds on foundations laid by the previous one. So it's important to take the time and go and listen to the older messages and build from that foundation. Even this particular series, this is part three. There's two other parts that started this. But you can even go all the way back and just go listening. You will be blessed. They are freely available. Listen and be blessed and your life will not remain the same. Um, you'll find our live streams, our services, Wednesday, Sunday. You'll find them. We are excited to have you. If you have questions, we have a question and answer live session every Thursday, 8 p.m. in Ugandan time, East African time. That is um, usually about noon in central time in the united states uh uganda is gmt plus three for eight for those of you who are in other time zones and tune in you can tune in and ask your question live maybe your question is from these strong meat sessions you are free to bring it to q and a we will discuss it we will be glad to give you answers as the spirit gives us utterance we are also absolutely dependent on the spirit so tune in your life will not remain the same this church believes in the word this church believes in the word. So our most important meeting as a, as a ministry is our Bible studies on Saturday. I want to encourage you to tune in. It's on Zoom. So all you have to do is send us a message and we'll send you the Zoom details. We can't publish them because, you know, we want to avoid Zoom bombers and people like that. But we can. We would love to have you. If you drop us a message, info at breakthroughmiraclelife.org, we will be pleased to do that. Or you can send us a Facebook message or comment on this YouTube video itself and we will send you the details glad to have had you today looking forward to seeing you again next week or tomorrow in our service thursday god bless you bye bye
Hi there. Thank you for watching. Join our online family by subscribing to our YouTube page, Breakthrough Miracle Life Ministries Kampala. Follow us on Facebook, Breakthrough Miracle Life Ministries, Noah Samatimba. Find us on Telegram and you'll be able to access all of our past content dating from many years ago right there on our channel, Breakthrough Miracle Life Ministries, to find past and recent content videos and audios for you to download. You can also contact us through our social media pages or email us at info at breakthroughmiraclelife.org to join our WhatsApp group to receive real-time updates and also interact with Breakthrough members. To listen to wonderful sounds of praise, worship, and the Word of God, choose Breakthrough Online Radio via www.mixlr.com slash breakthrough playing for you 24-7. Or download the MixLR app from Google Store or Apple Store. Sign in and enjoy programming tailor-made for you to strengthen your walk in Christ. The radio is also the best option for those who have limited internet bandwidth or packages as it uses very little data and can function even on slow connections. God bless you.